This is the beginning of chapter 10, Early Medieval and Romanesque Art. It's in several separate sections. I believe three is the magic number for chapter 10. Unlike um, uh, many of the chapters that we're covering, this one is my particular specialty. So I have a lot of bonus features here. I hope you find this interesting, especially the early medieval part. So um, here we go. Early Medieval and Romanesque Art The early medieval period, formerly referred to as the Dark Ages, was a period of migrations. Following de the decline of the Roman Empire, which you saw, uh, many groups moved around throughout Europe in search of a better land. This is the sequence of material for this module. First of all, a general background of Celtic and Germanic art styles, and this is a total bonus feature just for you. Then we're going to look at Hiberno-Saxon art. Those terms may not mean anything at the moment, but they soon will. Carolingian art, Spanish art, Ottonian art, and Romanesque art at the very end. The final section is Romanesque, which is a pretty significant um, period of art. So as we start now, we're going to look at the general background of Celtic and Germanic art styles. And this is because I believe that at the times we were looking at the Roman and Greek culture, which you can see indicated here on the map by the little splotches of green and purple, that there was other stuff happening in the north of Europe. And, and that other stuff includes two large ethnic groups, and one is Celts, and that's what we're going to look at first. So Celtic people are a... a diverse group of tribes. They were not, never organized in any sort of federation of tribes, but they they lived in uh, small communities. They had chieftains. They did not have a written language. Um, and let's see, in the first century, the Romans had conquered Gaul and Britain and absorbed many of the Celts. Well, we're going, that's my narrative for slightly later. But this is what's happening 700 to 100 BCE. So we're going to see what the Celts were all about first, then we'll look at the Germanic peoples. Um, so here's some Celtic pieces from this time. And remember, unlike the Etruscans, these people are not coming in everyday contact with Greeks or Romans. They are living in the woods and up in areas far, far away from the Romans. So their art styles evolve differently, quite differently. So, so stylized figures are one of the significant characteristics where they are really in a symbolic mode, but it's more than that. Uh, you can see certain parts of the body are emphasized and certain parts are de-emphasized. For instance, there is an emphasis on the head. The head is enlarged in proportion to the body. But uh, appendages like arms and legs are almost negligible. This poor little man's arms are just crossed. And eyes are exaggerated too. But all of the characteristics of the face of the, are, are just sort of graphically reduced to little symbols. Then they use uh, trumpets and triskels and spirals uh, liberally to make these beautiful, beautiful arrangements of these abstract shapes. Um, and I hope you can see that. This is a shield over here on the right, a beautiful shield that was not actually a functional shield, but it was created as a an offering to the Celtic deities. So they worshiped a lot of nature deities kind of like the Japanese, where uh, they would believe that the waters, rivers, and springs all had deities in them, so they would throw offerings, and sometimes these offerings included uh, human sacrifice, but they would, they would give these up to the, the deities that they thought were at the source of these waters. And that's where this shield came from. It had been thrown into the Thames River um, which is the river that is in London, England. So that's a nice shield. Another thing about the Celts is that I told you they were not historic, so they did not have their own writing. They didn't record their own names or anything. So most of what we know about Celtic people 
comes from observations by Greeks and Romans who saw them as other and as barbarians. And the term barbarian simply means somebody who doesn't speak Greek or Latin. Um, and so there was a fascination. I showed you the Gallic trumpeter earlier when we were looking at Greece. So on the right is another piece from this group. And this is a Gallic chieftain. Uh, these were Roman copies. So the Greeks made them originally out of fascination with this exotic other. And then the Romans also caught up with that and copied them. So on the right, the, the chieftain has been captured. He's been defeated by the Greek army. One presumes his, his tribe has been captured and, and outmanned and outgunned. No, I know. There's no guns. Uh, so rather than be captured by the Greeks and humiliated, he's chosen to end his own life. But first he killed his wife, so she's hanging here, dangling sort of like a rag doll, and now he's plunging the knife into his own chest. And the gore of the situation is emphasized by the artist, including like dribbles of blood coming down his chest. But just like the trumpeter, um, the chieftain is shown in, nude, indicating that this is what the Greeks observed. They observed the, the Celts, the Gauls, fighting without any armor or bodily protection. I also told you about this man thickening his hair into these sort of dreadlocks. Um, the wife is shown with this, like her hair thickened, and the man, the chieftain, also. So um, they wrote a lot of outlandish things about their neighbors, the, the Greeks and Romans did. And the Romans really took over the narrative during the Roman Empire. So we get a lot of material from them, and it's not 100% reliable. You always have to take it with a grain of salt because uh, they did look down on these people. So that's, um, that's the Celtic peoples. And then next we have a large group of Germanic peoples. And these, these were the ones who occupied the rest of Northern Europe that was um, not pink on the first map. So there are different periods, and, and this generally we're going to refer to them all as Germanic people because their language all is from the same root, which, by the way, is the same root as English. So what you're listening to and what I'm speaking is a Germanic language. Um, so there were Vikings, which are offshoots, and these were the tribal peoples who lived up in Scandinavia. And then... There's a Christian period also. So um, this is after the conversion, which you can generalize, generalize to be right around the year 1000 when um, the last Scandinavian countries were Christianized. So uh, tribal groups of these Germanic peoples include Goths, in the Ostrogoths, and the Visigoths. And Austro and Visi just means Eastern and Western Goths. Then we have the Norse, who are the Vikings, some of them. And Franks, where we get the name Frank, France. Uh, Angles, where we get the name England. Uh, Saxons, uh, there's Saxony in Germany, but the Angles and Saxons and Jutes all moved over to England. So they uh, become the English. Uh, but they intermarry with Celts who are already there. And then we have Vandals who are down in Spain and move down into North Africa. Lombards in the north of Italy and Turingians. I'm not real sure where the Turingians lived. And here's two pieces of Germanic art. So these are tribal groups also. They did form alliances. Um, not that it really helped them, but it, it eventually they did sack Rome. So, I mean, it, uh, yeah, there's some progress there. The Celts, on the other hand, were completely overwhelmed by the Romans because they, they would not um, help each other. They would not join up to fight. So, Germanic art tends to be small and portable, at least the stuff that survives. So, they were very much into decorating themselves and wearing fancy jewelry and there are aspects of the jewelry which I'm going to show you. So there are certain elements of style. Um, and one is animal style. So they loved decorating their jewelry and other pieces with 
likenesses of animals, and almost no animal was was uh, out of bounds. So you can see animals in all of these, I hope. Uh, not down here. These are not animals. And then gem style, so they liked things that were colorful and sparkly, so they would um, put little pieces of sparkly stone or glass in some of their jewelry to get that gem style glittering there. Interlace was a particular Germanic characteristic where they would have these long sinuous strands of snake-like creatures or quadrupeds or bipeds in this case with long, long limbs that would just intertwine. So you can see interlace on a lot of these. Uh, interlacing here, interlacing here. Um, and this is a, one of my favorite pieces. It will show up on your quiz, so please pay attention. This is this was done by pagan Anglo-Saxons. It was found in England, so it was found in the tomb of an Anglo-Saxon king, where he was buried in a ship, which is also very common with these Germanic peoples, uh, to equip them for the journey to the afterlife or the um, the whatever their ever after was and it, it varies slightly this was a shoulder clasp so um, I'm going to show you more details but I wanted you to see both pieces so this there were two pairs of these buried with the king and um, they would fit together. You can kind of see on the right piece these little extensions here. These are like a loop of a hinge and there were more pieces on this side. The, the two pieces would fit together like the hinge of a door and then this pin would be driven through them to attach it. And these uh, two large pieces have little loops on the back like button loops and they would have been sewn on his cloak. So he would have two on the front of his cloak and two on the back of his cloak, and then they would uh, be attached with this little golden pin. So let's look at this, this artwork. It's just absolutely amazing. You'll need to know that it's a shoulder clasp. Um, here shows the back of a reproduction of this. I mean, I'm not the only person who thinks these are amazing. And somebody down here is crafting one to show you a sense of scale. Uh, so this is a reproduction of it. Um, so on this piece, you can see the interlacing animals around the outer margin. These have been, uh, uh, I'm trying to think what the term is. I want to go Mule Fiore, but it's not Mule Fiore. It's a uh, cloisonne, where this, um, these animals have been carved out of the gold background or possibly cast into the gold background and then ground up glass, in this case red glass, has been dropped into these little openings. Then the whole piece is heated and the ground glass melts and fills up the openings. So that's uh, Mille Fiore. Oh, sorry, Cloisonne. This in the inside are little cells with different things. Um, also some Cloisonne in here and then these, these little uh, checkerboards, blue and black checkerboards are, that's the Mille Fiore, where long strands of blue and black glass would have been uh, stretched out and then fused together and sliced off, uh, sort of like slicing off lunch meat. And you get this little cross section of the fusing. But my, so I'm just, I mean, look at the size of this over here and the craftsmanship required to make this. Now let's look at the top part because this absolutely is my favorite. This shows more animals and it's not, I, yeah, can you look at it? Can you figure out what the animal is? These are two boars or pigs, wild pigs. And wild pigs or boars show up quite a bit in Germanic art as sort of a protector, a sign of strength this is an area where there are no lions. So in lieu of lions, which we saw a lot of around uh, the Near East, we have boars. So um, let's look over here. This is the head of one boar. This is the head of another boar, the other one. So let's follow it across. This is his little head, his jaw, his open jaw here. This is his eye right there. 
and this is his backbone or his like spine along the ridge of the back um, there are there's fur that sort of stands up I think this could be representing that uh, this is his hind leg and his little curly pigtail there uh, his foreleg here has a mille fiore shoulder joint, a nice ham bone there, and comes down there. So both of these are done sort of transparently overlapping each other, but there's two bores here um, in just this fabulous design. All around here, of course, you have more snaky-like creatures. And this should give you an idea that these barbarians, these wild people that were looked down upon by the Greeks and Romans had a very high craftsmanship, very fine um, doing stuff like that. This now is a map from 526 AD after the Roman Empire has fallen to the Goths and the pink area is the Byzantine Empire, which we have seen, we've looked at, and I told you it was very important to remember that when Islam arose over here, that Byzant it was still part of the Byzantine Empire in, in um, Palestine here. So each one of these colors is a different Germanic groups, and they're all labeled, so you can see their location. You can kind of see it. Sorry, it's very pixelated, but it's, a, it's such a great map I had to show you. The orange sections are the Celts. So it's an interesting story that they were living in the British Isles. They had exclusive reign of the British Isles until the Romans came. When the Romans occupied Britain, they pushed the Celts out, the ones who would not be conquered, uh, to the reaches over here, this little... Uh, outgrowth is Wales and they were down here in Cornwall and they were up in Scotland and the Romans never came to Ireland so that never was uh, exposed to Roman culture at all and then after the Romans left Germanic peoples came in the Angles and Saxons and occupied England and I told you that they intermarried a lot with the indigenous Celtic people eventually there are going to be Scandinavians who also come into England so there's it the whole early Middle Ages of Europe is pretty interesting because there's just so much movement moving around of people okay so now you've seen the patchwork of uh, why we look at early early medieval and there the Celts on the left that big pink swath up here, all this white area with Germanic people. This is as far as the Romans went in the first century CE. That was the, the widest extent of the Roman Empire up there. And then this is what happens um, in three later centuries. So the Romans shrank, the Celts also got pushed out, and the Germanics just took over lots and lots of Europe. And the Celts, I should also point out, this huge big swath, only the ones who were not absorbed or, or there, there's a blending of Celt and Roman culture, but the ones who remained sort of intact or purely Celtic, that's the orange swath. There's Celts still throughout Europe, um, but that's what we're looking at. So now we're... Um, we're going to look at Hiberno-Saxon, also known as insular art. And this is a hybrid style from the British Isles, uh, Britain and Ireland, also known as Britannia and Hibernia, combining the elements from the Celtic and Germanic tradition. So it's a blending of these two styles. I just showed you how the Celts were living in the British Isles and then the Angles and Saxons came over. So that's when we get this blended style called Hiberno-Saxon, also insular. And insular just comes from the Latin word for island, which is insula, because England and Ireland are both island countries. That's almost a tongue twister. So, um, 
Terming these years as Middle Ages reflects the view of Renaissance humanists who regarded this time as a period of barbarism and decline. However, it was a period of innovation. Christianity gained strength as the Roman Empire crumbled. Clergy respon uh, sponsored the building of churches and making of sacred books. So these are the things that are going to be happening in the early Middle Ages. In the British Isles, our Hiberno-Saxon style here um, is seen in a manuscript. I also promised you manuscripts, and now you get to see some. So as Christianity spread through Europe, gospel books were in high demand. They held only the first four books of the Bible's New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The texts were similar to each other and narrated the life of Jesus. So in the... the tradition of gospel books, each book would be handled completely separately. At the beginning of it, there would be a very elaborate initial that starts off the gospel. But there would also be an illustration of um, often the person writing the book, the gospel writer, so it would be a picture of a human, or uh, the symbol that was commonly used to represent that gospel writer. And um, Matthew was represented as a man, so you, you, know, you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at a representation of Matthew whether this book used symbols or portraits. I mean, it's not a real portrait. Nobody knew what they looked like. Um, Mark was a lion. Luke was a bull and John was an eagle. So if you ever see that group of symbols, that's what they represent. I think we may have an example somewhere. I just chose to, um, to omit that because it, you have enough to focus on. So this portrait or this gospel writer of Matthew was created in Ireland in a place that had not seen the Roman Empire at all. And this this little head of the, the man here really strongly resembles the little heads of, that I showed you of the Celtic work. Let's see. So I showed you this head earlier when I was talking about the characteristics of Celtic art, and I said everything else about the body is sort of negated, but the head is emphasized, and then it's also abstracted. So here is Matthew's head. Uh, you don't even see his arms. Look at his tiny little feet, barely, barely visible. His body has become like just a very decorated shield shape, just in patterns, um, and his head very strange. Also, uh, a nice geometric or um, meaning is not snakes. It doesn't have heads and feet, but it's just plain old interlace going around his gospel page. So this, uh, this is very old. It was in the 7th century and created in Ireland, as I said. So this is another very important gospel book, um, the Book of Kells. A gospel book was lavishly illuminated, mostly at a monastery in Ireland, although it had been started over in England. And the monks in the English monastery... Um, escaped. They were refugees from Viking attacks and they took everything with them including this half-finished manuscript and took it over to Ireland and then finished it there. Um, in that gospel book of the Book of Kells there's a very special piece and this is at a passage in the first book, uh, Matthew 1.18 the first mention of Jesus Christ in a gospel book is at Matthew 1.18. And in um, Celtic, or you could say insular books, any, any Celt anything from the British Isles, they give very special treatment to the beginning of that verse in Matthew 1.18. And the unabbreviated text on the page is, uh, Christi autem generatio, uh, which means Christ therefore was born. So that's all that is here. And this is the X of Christ, because this would have been uh, a Latin abbreviation, I'm sorry, a Greek abbreviation, uh, Christi with an X and a, um, a Rho, an Iota, Christi. 
Um, so this is the X, this is the row, the or the R, and this is the I of Christi. And way down here are the rest of the letters, the uh, Altem Generatio. So um, the page before this would have just been regular letters, da -da 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 -da, like that, leading up to the birth announcement of Jesus. And then it gets to Matthew 1, and a whole page is dedicated to this. It's like an explosion. It's a celebration that at this point in history, everything changed. Jesus was born. So the Book of Kells prioritizes ornament over figure, especially seen on the Cairo Iota page. At first, the page seems filled only with letters and abstract ornament, but human and animal forms are present also. So... Um, I, before we look at details, and I've got some great details to show you, you have to look at the size of this page. It is about the size of a piece of normal typing paper, 11, almost 13 inches by 9.5. It's a little larger than your normal typing paper. And you get into the details of it, and you start to see this amazing amount of very, very fine drawing. And um, it would be nice to have a, a ruler across this so I could show you the scale, but I can't. That's why I, I emphasize the dimensions of the page so you could get a sense of that. So on this page you see circles, and within circles, more circles, and within those more circles, spirals, and it just keeps going down. And never forget, all of this was drawn with a feather, a quill pen dipped in an ink bottle. Um, but the little hidden gems in the Cairo iota include this pair of cats. A cat and mouse scene may signal the triumph of good over evil. So we have two cats with maybe kittens on their backs, maybe mice that they've caught. I mean, they're, they're not... They're not that naturalistic. You can't just definitively say that's a kitten. And then it looks like the rats or the mice have a little wafer between them or some piece, something that they both want and they're fighting over. So that's just sort of tucked in down here. Uh, it has no, no relevance to what's going on in the text, this page. And over here, one of my favorites, this black figure is an otter with his head down, and he's caught a fish. I hope you can see that. And here's his little otter tail coming out. Great stuff. Notice all these tiny spirals and decorations. They just don't stop here. And on this side, over here on this side of this, um, this bar of the Kai, we've got two angels with their feathered wings kind of intertwined. They've got yellowish hair. And by the way, the, the Book of Kells does not use any gold. Uh, many manuscripts do use real gold, but um, it would appear that gold was not available at the monastery that created this. So they use yellow as an imitation of gold. Um, beautiful little angels and another little angel peeking out up here. Right there. So um, it's, it's, there are plenty of websites where you could enlarge this and check out all the details and all the craftsmanship. It's, it's really unbelievable. And I should say that there was a lot of decoration in the rest of the Gospel book as well, but nothing at this level. And that just emphasizes the importance that the Irish, the Christian Irish monks placed on this passage in the book. So another thing that I like, I am I think I've already told you that manuscripts are my area of specialty, so I uh, I'm actually <laughs> being very restrained and not showing you more. Uh, but this is one that I particularly like. I love this lion. I love his leaping, the form of the body, the curls of the hair, that lovely tail. Um, and then look at this abstract background with this almost like a maze dividing the page. And here it says in Latin, Imago Leonis, or the image of the lion. So this is Mark. Um, I did tell you that 
there was a symbol for each gospel writer. And so this, this gospel book used the symbols and not the writer portraits. So this book had been created in the north of England and taken to Christian missionaries on the continent to aid them in converting the pagan Saxons. The bold style of this beautiful animal reflects no influence of the classical world. Um, so no first-hand knowledge of lions at all. The only lion this artist ever would have seen would have been something handed down in a copy far, far removed from an actual lion. And the style of it it's, is quite distinct. It doesn't relate to Celtic or Germanic arts directly, but it comes from an offshoot of the Celts, this little remote and very barbaric group of Celts in the north of Scotland called the Pits. And they did a lot of rock art. They got their name from their pictures, the Pits. So um, another reason I think he's very cool. So let's move now and go see what's happening in Scandinavia, in that Germanic land. In the 5th century CE, Scandinavian animal style was untouched by the classical Med Mediterranean world. There is so much that is untouched by Greeks and Romans. The Gumersmark brooch here displays mostly symmetric designs with animal forms. So um, I showed you some brooches, but we didn't really discuss them, but jewelry was so so very important and people would show their wealth and their importance by wearing really flashy um, brooches which are pins brooch is just a, a word for a very large pin and this pin has animals going around the upper part let me give you some details here so there's um, the head of this pin these little shapes that are encircling this are thought to be representative of bird heads where the circle is the bird eye and the little triangular shape is the bird beak that is open. And then the foot of the pin has even more um, animals. I hope you can see these. So I've I've read a lot of barbarian art and had to look at lots and lots of animal forms. So. Um, I have become accustomed to looking for the eye and when, once you find an eye then you can sort of sort out the body so here's the eye right here this is an open jaw this would be the forearm or foreleg and this is the hind leg here there's another animal over here with an eye and an open jaw swinging open uh, they're not always shown uh, in their complete with their complete body, but there it is. So animal style. This will show up on the quiz. What motif or what design element is used here in its animal style? So a couple of bonus features here because I know they have this romantic appeal, but some Viking pieces. A Viking sword on the left that has some very uh, decorative pommel up here, and the grip here with little panels of interlacing animals. I know it's really hard to read it. You don't have to worry about it. Take my word for it. If I say there's animals, there, there are. And then this amazing Viking helmet over here that shows a little human head right in between the eye holes, a nice uh, guard for the skull. So this would have added extra protection if, if the wearer of the helmet took a blow. Um, and of course there's no horns on it. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Vikings had horned helmets. They didn't. Um, but this is a boar. So I told you that the boars were special in Germanic culture. So here's another evidence of it. This boar protecting the head of this helmet wearer. And um, this beautiful metalwork. So in Scandinavia, we have a form of architecture uh, once they become Christian. Well, I think this also predates Christianity, but the only surviving ones we have are Christian ones. So these are called stave churches. So they would build churches in their own indigenous style, which is uh, wood. That's the only material they have. So we have yet another type of building here that's completely different from anything we have seen so far. 
This is a 12th century surviving state church in rural Norway. They are named for the four huge timbers that form the structural core. This Borgen church has steeply pitched roofs to protect the walls and rain from rain and snow. So um, I'm sure there's tons of snow here in the winter time, but it's going to fall pretty quickly off of those steep roofs. So let's look at the inside. So this is why it's called the stave church, because there are these tall timbers that uh, the church is built around. So it's a um, not a pile of stone. Uh, it's not defying gravity. Wood is much, much lighter. It's almost like building a large wooden tent because it hangs from these timbers. Stave Church. It also brings into the European architectural vocabulary great verticality. So it soars upward, and we haven't seen anything soaring upward yet, but we will. Hold on. So here is a door from a different stave church, um, and this is an urnus, and it just illustrates that interlace, the, the animal interlace that we've seen before, a beautiful carved door that is... Uh, rather unique in its style of interlace so that it gives its name to uh, any other pieces that resemble this but that's TMI for you you don't need to know that um, now here's a monument that I find really interesting I hope you enjoy this so Scandinavians carved and erected many rune stones and picture stones around the countryside uh, rooms this rune stone is in Yelling Denmark the three facets of the stone, so it's a very large stone with three sides, uh, hold distinct designs. So this is one side over here with a lion caught in uh, an interlace, sort of a lion, in a quadruped. I mean, I'm generously calling him a lion, but he's some kind of four-legged animal. Um, but there's a lot of interlacing going on there. On the right side, we see a crucifixion with a corpus or a body of Christ. But instead of being nailed to a cross, this body is entangled in vines. So it's kind of its own uh, idiom in Scandinavia. Um, the cross literally doesn't appear as a cross but Jesus is often shown entangled in those, those ubiquitous snakes. And the center stone, extremely interesting. These are the runes here, and there are runes over here. Um, I wonder if you have paused this or if you've gone ahead and read the inscription. So the text reads, King Harold, Bluetooth, ordered these monuments to be made in memory of his father Gorm and his mother Thura that Harald, who won the whole of Denmark and Norway for himself and who made Danes Christian. So he's commemorating the fact that he was a Christian and he brought his country of Denmark to Christ and built churches there as well. Um, and I put in, in brackets here Bluetooth because his name was Harold Bluetooth and the people who invented Bluetooth technology named it after this guy. So just a little connection you might enjoy. And um, the Vikings have a, a bad rap, and I couldn't leave this without discussing that. So Viking settlement. So the Vikings, the, the Norse people were originally farmers, but Norway is extremely mountainous. Sweden is a little more flat. Um, and they, they followed the rule of primogenitor, which m means that the oldest son inherited 100% of whatever the father owned. And so if you were a second or a third or fourth son, you had to go out and find your own land and your own fortune. And pretty soon, Sweden and Norway ran out of land. And so the second and third and fourth sons had to wander away and that's why you get this settlement, this spreading across Europe. And um, they really were coming originally for land, but they soon discovered that there was other stuff here, that they could just pillage and loot and take stuff and um, make a good living at that. I, I don't know. They had homes as well. So I showed you how the monks who made 
the Book of Kells had been attacked over here in um, the north of England and had moved over to Ireland to, um, to avoid them. But you can see that they came on ships and they attacked along coastlines. They went up rivers. They became the Bulgars. They became the Rus of Russia. So um, the, those Scandinavian people are... Did you see them down here? Yeah. Um, settlements. Norse settlements down there. This is the end of Chapter 10, Part 1. I hope you enjoyed this. It's my very favorite. And um, stay tuned for Part 2.